Hello, everyone. My name is Ole Kagan, and I'm the Community Engagement Coordinator for LA County Library, and I welcome you to Navigating Banking Apps. This program is supported in whole or in part by the U.S. Institute of Museum and Library Services under the provisions of the Library Services and Technology Act, administered in California by the State Librarian. And our topic today is Navigating Banking Apps, and your presenter is Lawrence Mack. Lawrence is a MakeMo or Maker Mobile librarian who does STEAM programs, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math all over LA County. He, he drives a colorful van and you can see him on any given day at a senior center, a school, a park, even a library. And today he's with us virtually to teach you about navigating banking apps. Lawrence, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for the introduction, Oleg. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the program. All right. So welcome to Navigating Banking Apps. Um, so today we're going to take a look at some mainstream mobile banking apps, including their typical banking features and some of the more popular apps out there. And again, if you have any questions during the program, please feel free to let us know in the chat. Um, and we'll attempt to address them all at the end during the Q&A session. Uh, for more library news, including upcoming programs, resources, and events, please visit us at lacountylibrary.org. And we're on all the major social media platforms, such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and more at LA County Library. So be sure to check us out there. Here's the description for our program. So did you know that you can access banking services from your mobile device? Learn the essential features such as deposits and payments available on banking apps and see how they differ from mobile payment apps such as Apple Pay and Venmo. So first off, uh, if you're new to mobile banking, you might be wondering what it exactly is. So mobile banking, a common definition is that it is a service provided by a bank or other financial institution that allows customers to conduct financial transactions remotely using a mobile device, such as, such as a smartphone, tablet, or other computing device. And for some interesting statistics for mobile banking in the US, it's estimated that as of 2022, uh, around 200 million people in the United States use digital banking services. And that many users who've used it do prefer mobile banking because of its convenience. Uh, the most important part is you can view um, your bank statements and your bank information 24-7 um, wherever you are. Uh, you don't need to uh, actually go to a bank in order to access that information. Uh, so it is very, very convenient to use. So let's take a look at how mobile banking came into being. So obviously um, before uh, we would used to just go to the bank, physically to the bank um, to maybe deposit checks, to um, deposit and withdraw cash. Um, now mobile banking initially became popular through SMS, which is like short message service or basically texting on your phone. Um, and that was pre 2010. So they relied on texting and also on mobile web browsers to facilitate transactions. Um, so mobile web is basically um, before we had these apps on our phone, um, you know, when, before we had Chrome and Safari and Firefox on our phones, um, the phones came with their own built-in web browsers and you would just kind of access, um, access the internet that way. But after 2010, when um, smartphones became much more popular, you had the Apple iPhone, you had Google's Android smartphones and other operating systems. Mobile banking apps became much more popular because they allowed a more streamlined, secure way of doing business. And along with more features being incorporated into their mobile apps. In fact, most major banks and institutions have apps which are available through the Apple App Store and the Google Play Store uh, including the institutions that are covered in this presentation. So you might be wondering, what 
services exactly are available for mobile banking apps? Well, there are some essential um, services that are included, and that saves you the convenience of having to go up to the teller window at your local bank, uh, with one major caveat that we'll touch on later. The most simple one is account information. So information such as your account statements and transaction histories, um, whether for your bank accounts, for your credit card accounts, they're readily available. And they usually go back for um, a set number of years. And the good thing about the statements in history is it's available in the app, but they're also available to download as PDFs so that you can print them out. Uh, very handy if you want to save those statements um, in an offline location, such as like a USB drive or a portable hard drive. Um, and depending on what services you have with the banks, um, if you have loans, if you have mutual funds or insurance with the banks, those records can be called up and displayed as well if those features are supported in that specific banking app. Um, the next feat essential service is for transactions. So many types of simple transactions can be done through mobile banking apps. And these include fund transfers from one account to another. It includes the payment of bills, including credit card bills, um, maybe utility bills, uh, any type of bills and remote deposit for paper checks. So the remote deposit feature is one that a lot of banking apps offer, uh, and that's where you take pictures of the check, the front and back, and then, um, and then those funds are dispersed to your account um, without needing uh, you to actually go to the physical bank and handing your check um, to the teller. Um, it's Pretty handy. And then there's also links to digital wallets. Um, so for example, uh, some apps let you link up your Google wallet or your PayPal account or any type of digital wallet um, to your bank app. And we'll touch on some of those services uh, in a bit. Okay, so moving on, another key feature of mobile banking apps is a way to manage your investments. So if you do have stocks, bonds, or mutual funds through the bank, if you have those investments through the bank, um, some of these apps do offer you ways to manage those investments. However, if you have those investments through another service, like a brokerage or trading platform, then, um, then that would be through another app. Um, those investments would not be available through your bank app. Now, the banking apps are also a good place for customer support for any issues or questions that you may have, um, because they'll usually contain contact information for the bank's customer support through phone, through email, or text. Um, and they also offer like FAQ sections. So that's like a facts and questions section um, and tutorial videos. So for simple problems, you might find the answer you're looking for through the, through the FAQ sections or tutorial videos, um, meaning that you don't need to contact um, a live person in order to resolve the issue. Um, and also some apps um, do have these little um, chat assistants where you can enter, um, enter simple questions and they can provide answers to that as well. So very useful um, place to get support information if you have those mobile banking apps. And most apps also let you update personal information in the settings as needed. So for example, um, let's say you change your address um, or something else happens. Um, you can definitely update personal information on the app instead of, um, instead of going to a bank for some of these banking apps. And also some banks will have a section of the app devoted to news and updates about the bank, including maybe offers or discounts um, that they have. And this is true if your credit card has a rewards program and your credit card is through the bank. Um, the app may let you manage those rewards or like for example, cash in your points 
or swap them for a gift card or something like that. Um, a lot of those apps do have those features. Okay, so here's uh, here's screenshots of um, banking apps from a lot of the major banks. So as you can see, um, these are screenshots of apps from Bank of America, from Chase, from Citibank, and from Wells Fargo. And one thing you notice is that the user interface of these apps is very similar to each other, which means if you know how to use one of these apps, you're more than likely going to be able to very quickly pick up and use another app. Uh, so, for example, if you take a look at um, if you take a look at these apps, uh, you'll see that many of them, uh, actually all of them, do have a toolbar at the bottom of the screen, and that lets you um, go around to different um, areas like pay and transfer, uh, payments, services, um, and then also an accounts page that they all have, and then. To further navigate, um, they might have a different um, set of buttons on the top that lets you open up additional menus um, or check for different options. All right, but most of their navigation is done in the toolbar at the bottom. And then uh, you would just manage whatever um, tab that you're at um, on the main part of the screen. All right, so here's some of the features that the mainstream banking apps do have. Um, one thing that, that, that I saw that differentiated it from the other mainstream banks was that I noticed the Bank of America app, they have their own virtual financial assistant. Um, it's called Erica and uh, it helps manage accounts and gives reminders. So it's like a virtual assistant, very similar to um, Siri if you used any Apple products or Alexa if you used any um, Amazon products. Um, so they, they have their own financial system. But otherwise, um, all of these major banks um, do let you manage your credit card accounts in addition to your uh, checking and savings accounts. They let you manage credit card rewards and cash back. They let you view credit score reports, um, which is a pretty nifty service. Um, especially if you're planning on um, on a major purchase um, of some kind, like buying a home or buying a car. And then also they offer peer-to-peer -peer payments um, to other bank accounts through the Zelle network. So Zelle is sort of like um, a transaction service that helps quickly facilitate transactions between different bank accounts. All right, and then now let's move on to online banks. So, uh, so as you can see, these mainstream banks, so Bank of America, Chase, Citibank, and Wells Fargo, these banks um, all have physical locations. Um, so, if there's something, um, if there's a service that you need that isn't on the mobile app, you can definitely just go to any physical location, walk in. Um, and a teller or banker um, can assist you in person with, um, with, your, um, with your needs. However, these banking um, apps from Discover, from Ally, and from Chime, uh, for example, these banks are fully online banks. So what's the difference? Well, uh, they do not have any physical locations. So all of their banking is done via the internet. Um, now, these banks, they might have lower fees than banks with physical locations. Um, and that's because of their cost savings from not having to maintain any physical locations. Um, so they might have lower fees. Uh, their banking apps have most of the essential features of their counterparts, of their, um, of their physical counterparts here. Uh, however, some online only banks may be harder to do peer to peer payments with accounts at other banks uh, because um, it's less likely that these online banks um, have the Zelle ser service. Um, so uh, it might take a little bit more time and there might be fees involved for peer to peer payments with accounts at, at other banks.
So while mobile banking apps are very useful and they're very convenient and arguably more secure than banking through your web browser, um, such as like if you're just doing banking through Google Chrome or Mozilla Firefox, um, using a mobile banking app can help mitigate some of the security issues that might come up. But uh, there are still some security issues that you need to be aware of. And the most important security issue is identity theft. Um, so for example, in 2021, roughly eight in 10 mobile users have concerns about fraud related risks. So it's a real concern, it's a real threat that might affect uh, you or I. Um, and the FTC revealed that in that year, 2021, there's over 5.7 million identity theft and fraud reports that were made. So over 5 million people experienced some form of identity theft or fraud, and they felt strongly enough about it to report it to the FTC. So there are ways to uh, mitigate the risk for security issues. So the most important part is to secure your mobile device. So whichever device you're doing your mobile banking from, whether it's your phone or your tablet, you want to secure it in a couple of ways. So physically, you want to use some kind of password for your device, whether it's a pin number, you know, a four or six digit or even eight digit pin number can help prevent unwanted users from accessing your device. Um, or you can use yourself as a password, biometric security. And that's where if your device has a fingerprint reader or a face reader, um, such as like the face ID, um, you use yourself as a password and without your own image or your own fingerprint, uh, that means your device is still locked. So definitely highly recommend you use some form of physical security um, to prevent unwanted access to your device. Now, the second method is uh, digitally. So after the physical, uh, you can also use something called a 2FA or two-factor authentication method of access to your um, mobile banking app. So that's when um, if you log in with your mobile banking app, sometimes you have to put in your email and your password, right? Now, this um, 2FA offers an additional layer of security where the app will send either a text to your phone, which you will then have to switch to your messaging app to get that code to enter, or it will use a 2FA app, um, something like uh, Microsoft Authenticator or Google Authenticator or Authy. Um, there are these 2FA apps that generate codes that you can use to log in. Um, so that adds uh, an additional layer of security that makes it harder for anybody who wants to access your account and your information, um, makes it hard, much harder for them to access. And lastly, never share your password. All right, so for your account, um, if you, um, the more complicated the password is, the better it is, and never share it. Um, if somebody contacts you claiming to be from like, for example, a bank customer support, and they ask you for your password, they usually won't do that. Um, and you should not share your password with anybody who, uh, who shouldn't uh, have access to your device or your accounts. Now, remember what I said earlier about mobile banking apps replacing teller services with one major caveat. Well, that one major caveat is that there are no cash-based transactions for the app. Um, some stores and services uh, might be cash only, and that means actually visiting a bank or an ATM. Um, and there are some limitations for mobile banking apps that are useful to know. So uh, for example, there's uh, lacking bank related services. All right, so a lot of these apps might have limited deposit amounts. So um, for example, if your check 
that you want to deposit on the app exceeds a certain amount, um, the app might reject it and have you actually physically go to the bank in order to deposit um, that high amount check. All right, um, they might have extra charges for certain services uh, such as uh, insurance and also for any physical services that still require visiting the bank, um, such as if you wanna pick up a checkbook, um, if you want to rent out a safety deposit box to put in physical valuables. Um, so those you would still need to physically visit a bank branch to access those services. And last but not least is technology. So many of these mobile bank apps, um, in fact, all of them have some sort of minimum technology requirement to be able to use it. So if your phone is too old, for example, if you have like an original iPhone or an original um, or an original Android phone, chances are you probably can't access, uh, you, you probably can't download and use the latest uh, versions of the mobile banking apps because um, they always update their apps uh, to make sure that those apps are supported by the latest devices with the latest operating systems. So, you know, if you want to access bank services at a physical bank, you don't need to change it. You always, you can always just walk in and use, what, use whatever services it is. However, for mobile banking apps, you'll need to make sure that um, your device can support using that app before you use it. But if, if your device is, is, um, is relatively new, like relatively modern, let's say within the past five, five years or so, um, you, you don't need to worry about any of that. And uh, yeah, it's only if you have really, really old devices that you might want to check out um, if, um, if your device can still support using the latest bank. All right, so now let's move on to mobile banking versus mobile payment. You might be wondering, what about the apps uh, mentioned earlier, like Apple Pay or Venmo or PayPal or Google Wallet? Um, so these are actually a bit different from mobile banking apps as they are intermediary service provider apps. And that means they act as a middleman between financial institutions such as banks and, um, and actual operators, such as like the cash register, the cash terminal, or the stores. Um, so you can think of mobile payment apps as extensions of the payment functions um, from banks that provides extra convenience. Um, because mobile banking apps can transfer money between accounts, fine. So if you're transferring money from your checking account to another person's checking account, Banking apps can handle that just fine. But if you want to use your banking app, let's say you want to use your Citibank app or your Chase app um, to pay a merchant through, for example, a cashier terminal, it's really hard to do because they just don't provide that, um, that interface. But mobile payment apps, such as like Apple Pay or Venmo, or even more international options like Alipay, they're increasing accepted at a wide variety of merchants. Um, you know, for example, you can they provide a code that you can scan, or they have something called NFC, which is like a wireless payment method. And if you just hold your device close to the payment terminal, then that can authorize the transaction as well. So it just makes paying merchants a lot easier um, as opposed to moving money between bank accounts. All right, so, um, so here's a recap of what we covered. So we found out what's mobile banking. Um, and we found out what are some of the typical mobile banking services that are offered in these apps and what some of the mainstream banking apps are. So we took a look at some of the mainstream banks like um, Bank of America, Chase, Citibank, and also some online only bank like Discover or Ally. We also found out about some security issues um, that we need to be aware of. And also what's the difference between mobile banking apps, which are good for 
paying between other bank accounts and payment apps, uh, which are good for paying stores and merchants. Now here's some mobile banking resources um, from the various, uh, from some of the various major banks that I covered. And um, a copy of this presentation will be sent out um, to all of you um, after this program. So don't worry uh, if you want to like copy the link or something, it will all be sent to you uh, in, in, in a follow-up email. Uh, and also some links to the mobile banking tips and mobile payment services from the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, that's the federal government arm and they provide some um, uh, security tips for mobile banking and mobile payment as well. We also have a lot of library resources um, for uh, personal finance. Um, so we do have a lot of eBooks and audiobooks and actual books in our catalog. Um, as you can see, uh, here's a sample of some of them. Uh, and also you can further your uh, learning on this topic and other digital literacy topics through our online learning resources. Um, for example, LinkedIn Learning and Yale courses provide um, free online classes that you can use to expand your learning. And also for other um, digital literacy topics, we definitely have our uh, series that, um, that goes on every Thursday at 11 o'clock. We cover new topics and you're more than welcome to join us in our future presentations as well. You can find um, these resources and more at lacountylibrary.org slash learn. And if you have any questions, either about the topics covered in this uh, presentation or just in general, you can always speak to a librarian. We're available um, over the phone, through text, through email, and through Instant Librarian, which is a sort of chat-based service. And uh, all of that is available at lacountylibrary.org slash contact us. And you're also more than welcome to visit um, your local library come up to the reference desk and we'll be happy to help you with any information services uh, that uh, you require. All right, and that's the presentation. Thank you so much for joining, um, joining me for Navigating Banking Apps. And uh, let's move on to the Q&A. Thanks, Lawrence. So I don't have any questions in at the moment, but now is the time. If you have questions about anything that Lawrence has presented up to this point, um, go ahead and put it in the Q&A. I know that one of the things that we've had questions about in the past um, at Navigating Banking Apps and other kinds of programs is the safety of Navigating Banking Apps. You know, the chances of a hacker um, getting in and you know, getting your information. So Lawrence, what would you say about, you know, if somebody was concerned about privacy or safety when using these, for instance, the mobile apps particularly, um, what would, is, is it safe? Should they do it? Should they be worried about it? Well, um, so the mobile banking apps are, are more secure than accessing these services through a web browser. Um, so I would say uh, if so, so I would say they're good like these services for the most for the majority of people um, are pretty safe as long as you take um, safety precautions. So that includes um, not accessing your banking information on open Wi-Fi networks uh, and protecting your um, your PIN numbers, your passwords, and all of that login information that can be used to access your account. All right. Well, I don't see any questions in our chat right now. So I'm going to once again, let folks know about next week's program. And that is spotting misinformation online Thursday, May 4th. Um, if you're not sure how to evaluate information online, if you see a lot of things that are posted on your social media or on websites and they make you go, hmm, then we will give you a framework and teach you how to determine whether something is more or less accurate. And that's going to be next Thursday at 11 o'clock. 
on spotting misinformation online. I'm, I'm once again going to post that information in the chat. You can register for that. That is absolutely free. Lawrence, thanks again for this presentation and thank you all for being here. So we, we did get a question right now in the chat. Is Zelle safe? Zelle is one of the most popular peer-to-peer uh, -peer, uh, finance apps, right, Lawrence? I think you mentioned you mentioned it earlier in the presentation. Yeah, um, so most of the major banks, um, they do use Zelle for transactions between their accounts. Um, so uh, uh, I would say it's it's a more trusted app and it is um, it is safe to use as long as um, as long as you use common sense. So, um, for example, if somebody, if a random stranger asks you to pay for something in Zelle, um, maybe, maybe try to, uh, maybe, maybe think about whether that's the proper way to do it. But if it's sending a payment to friends or family or other people that that you know and trust, yeah, it's it's a safe way to transfer money. Thanks for that question. And so, uh, all I wanted to ask. A question to our audience, and that is, if you would please fill out air our post event survey. So we have a post event survey that we send out after every event. And we do that so that we can get your feedback. Was this program helpful? What topics would you like us to cover in the future? And more and more. I'm going to post the link to that post event survey in the chat right now. And while I do that, we had a follow up question here. Can you compare Venmo and Zelle? I've used Venmo. Um, I don't know, Lawrence, have you used Venmo or Zelle? Um, so I have not used Venmo. Um, I have used Zelle. Um, so, okay. Um, so Venmo is available as a separate app. And so is Zelle, but there are some differences because if, so for Venmo, you connect your bank account to, or credit card to the Venmo app, and then you send the funds uh, to other users with the Venmo app. Now for Zelle, it's a little different because now if your bank does use Zelle, then you can't use it as a standalone app. Um, they will tell you you have to use Zelle through your mobile banking app instead. Um, um, so that's the major difference um, between their users. Otherwise, uh, it's pretty much the same, I believe. In terms of safety, I don't think that either one is more or less safe than the other. I think they're both legitimate ways to transfer money at this point, considering their popularity, the credibility, and their uh, adapta adapta adaptation, Adop adoption, adoption um, among popular financial institutions or come a bit large financial institutions. Um, speaking of financial institutions, we had a question in the Q&A, is Chime a legitimate bank card? So I looked at the website of Chime just kind of while you were answering the question, Lawrence, and it looks like it's FDIC insured and it's issued by the Bancor Bank. It looks like it is, I mean, I don't know for sure because I've never used it and have just only looked at their website now, but it seem and I, I've seen ads for Chime. So it, it does seem like it is a legitimate enterprise. But again, I think it's, it has, it's similar to what you were saying, Lawrence, with, it looks like it's an online concern. So it's an online uh, bank. Mm -hmm. And so I think the same things would apply to Chime as with the other online banks that you mentioned. Uh, are the middle are the middle class tax refund cards safe to use? I don't know. That's that's something that I, I'm not sure what that is. So, uh, where does it come from? That's the is, is that something that the IRS is sending out? Because I I have never received any kind of cards from the IRS. They usually send out a check when they send it, or they if you have direct deposit set up with the IRS, they'll usually just put the money right into your bank account. So. Yeah, I think we'll, we would need more information to even try to answer that question. Uh, oh, it's supposed to be from the state? Yeah, um, it's, um, it's a tax refund from the California Franchise Tax Board. Mm -hmm. And I think if you don't have like 
a bank account on file with them, uh, they might okay. issue it in a debit card form. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they'll, they'll send you a letter with the with the information, with the amount that's on there, and they'll give you a card to use. So if it comes from the California, if the Franchise Tax Board, then just, you know, knowing no other information, and I would say that I would lean towards that it's safe to use, or at least there's no risk in trying it, if there's, there's going to be money on it. Um, somebody mentioned that I came in late. Is PayPal and Venmo from the same company? Yes. So Venmo, um, Venmo started in 2009, but it was bought by PayPal in uh, 2013. So they, it, it, Venmo is owned by PayPal. So regarding the 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 tax card or the tax refund card, uh, our commenter says seems like high usage fees on it. Yeah, that that's something that. I wouldn't be able to address yet knowing very little about that topic. Mm -hmm. But if that's the way that's that's the way that you have your refund, I don't know what other what other what 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 else to do. So if they if the if you don't have a bank account, the only way they send you the money is via the card, then but I I, I would you can always call the franchise tax tax board and ask them about it. Oh, yeah, it looks like somebody posted the number in the chat here. Um, I'm going to repost it. So give me one second here. Try, try the the uh, copying and pasting process is taking taking a little bit longer than I was expecting. Uh, okay, so yeah, so if you have that card. Um, if you have questions about it, here's the number that you can call. Thank you, Jenny, for put, posting that in our chat. We're all doing live research here, which is, I think, the fun of all, all of us being together in the same place. We can all, we, we can try to help as much as we can, and then the folks out there, you all, can also help each other. It's a pre, she said, it's a prepaid debit card. So yeah, no, no bank needed. So in this situation where somebody doesn't have a bank account or accessible bank account, that card is something they can use without any, without having a need for any other institution. All right, uh, let's give it another second, Lawrence, for any other questions. I know that, that I've been using banking apps for quite a long time, even when I had, uh, I, I've banked with large banks and bank credit unions, and most of them now have Bank, banking apps of varying quality and ver offering varying features, um, but in the de check deposit uh, feature of some of these apps have come in hand. I used to go to the bank, you know, the physical bank, and deposit my checks when I received them, um, and you know, that was it took time. But now you can just take a picture and it'll deposit. It's like magic um, when it recognizes the writing on your check. Sometimes it doesn't recognize it and you, know, you got to write something on the back. It's like, oh, it doesn't, doesn't, doesn't grab it. Um, so when it, when it works, it's really nice. So I don't see any other questions in the Q&A or the chat. So I'm going to conclude the program saying once again, thank you, Lawrence, and thank you all for being here. And we'll see you next week.